try to please leave that gap in front of the door completely open for the brothers that come late so they can adjust immediately. Yeah, more, if you can come. There is space. More, more. If you can make some more space by the door, please. Thank you. <coughs> there is plenty of space on this side. Al-Fatiha. صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسع ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمن من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم يأن للذين آمنوا أن تخشع قلوبهم لذكر الله أن تخشع قلوبهم لذكر الله وما نزل من الحق So when you're gathering with a loud remembrance upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad As a gift to the soul of Sayyidi wa Mawlai Al-Qasim ibn Al-Hasan, recite the second salawat. As a gift to the soul of Sayyidi wa Mawlai Abu Abdullah Al-Hussein, recite the third salawat to the loudest of your voices. What prompted me to choose my topic this evening was a discussion that I had with a young man not too long ago. A question that he asked of me. He came to me and he said, Sayyid, unfortunately I have been involved in excessive amount of sinning. And I often find myself leading a life of sinning. 
And I often find that my lifestyle has turned into a lifestyle of a sinful human being. As if I'm, so, I'm inseparable from sin. I have committed the major sins. And I constantly find myself com- committing those major sins repeatedly. Do you believe that it is appropriate for me to take part in the majalis of Imam Hussein? Do you believe it's appropriate for a person like me to be present in such places? And my answer to him was indeed, if you choose to purify yourself, to purify your heart, to purify your entire existence, to purify your soul and your body, then this is the place for you. And if you choose to take steps closer to Allah, and begin a new chapter in your life, a life of peace, a life of tranquility, then this is the place for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran states, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu dkhulu fi silmi kaffah wa la tattabi'u khutuwat al-shaytan. O oh, you believers, if you wish to lead a life of harmony, if you wish to lead a life of tranquility and a peace of mind, then enter into the obedience of Allah and take yourself out of the disobedience of Allah. Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu, udkhulu fi silmi kaffah, enter into peace, welcome peace into your life, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ And do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan. Therefore I told him, if you like to start a new chapter, a good life, then this is the place for you. And I will tell you why. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam has stated, and a very famous tradition, and a very famous hadith, إن الحسين مصباح الهدى وسفينة النجاة. Hussein is the torch of enlightenment, and he is also the ark of salvation. What do I mean? Hussein is the torch of enlightenment. You see, brothers and sisters, we live in a dark life. We live in a very dark world, and imagine. If they placed you in a very dark room, and this room was full of obstacles, this room was full of hurtful things, and they told you you have to get in from one side and get out from the other. Why do I resemble this life to a room, a dark room? Because they asked the Prophet Nuh, they said to him, you're the longest living prophet of God. And when Azrael came to take his soul away, he said to him, Nuh, you have lived for 1,500 years. Describe this life to me. He said, I was placed in a room with two doors. I got in from one and I am exiting from the other. That's it. 1,500 years. Let's not be happy with the 70 and 80. They will pass very fast. So this is a dark room full of obstacles, full of temptations, full of desires and deviations. And we need a light switch. We need to turn on the light so we can refrain from those obstacles. So that we do not hurt ourselves. And that light switch is Imam Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Why does Rasulullah says, say, Hussein, illuminate our lives? Let me give you an example. When Imam Hussein left, 
Mecca to Karbala has long journey from Saudi Arabia, from Arabian Peninsula, all the way to Iraq. He would camp at rest areas, different rest areas. He stopped at a specific rest area, and it was not time for him to camp. So they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, you're camping early today. This is an early rest area, why? He said to them, don't worry, camp here, rest here. So they rested. And Imam Hussein sent his messenger to a man by the name of Zahir ibn al Qain. His messenger came to Zahir ibn al Qain. Who was Zahir ibn al Qain? He was Ibn al Qain. He was amongst the most famous of the Tabi'een. And he was by far the richest man in the Arabian Peninsula. And outside the Arabian Peninsula. He was possibly one of the richest men alive in his time. He owned property all over the Arabian Peninsula, outside the Arabian Peninsula. He had cattle, he had camels, he had horses. And he was camping near the camp of Imam Hussein. And he was having lunch with his wife. So the messenger came and he said, Zuhair ibn al Qain, he said, That's me. He said, I am the messenger of Hussein ibn Ali ibn Rasulullah. Sabtu Rasulullah. He said, What is the message? He says, Message is Hussein is nearby camping. And he's asked to see you. He's asked to meet you. Zuhair ibn al Qain. The books describing the Sahaba and the Tabi'een state كان عثماني الهوى What does عثماني الهوى mean? You know that when Uthman was killed the death of Uthman was attributed to Imam Ali wrongfully and that led to the battle of Safin and that led to the battle of Jamal the battle of Safin by Muawiyah bin Abu Sufyan and the battle of Jamal by Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr. The most hurtful times in the Islamic history. Hundreds of thousands of casualties. Because they accused Amir al muminin of the murder of Uthman. Anyhow, this is a part of history that needs to be examined in a different lecture. So he, this man was Uthmani al Hawa, meaning he was amongst those seeking the vengeance of Uthman from whom? From Imam Ali. So he was against Ahlul Bayt, he was against Imam Ali. He stood against Imam Ali and Imam Hassan and Hussein and Jamal and Safin. And he was also known to be amongst the bravest of Arabs. So he said to the messenger, go back to Hussein. I don't want to see Hussein. I have nothing to do with Hussein. Let me carry on my food, eating my food. When he left, and the messenger remained for a little bit, maybe taking care of his cattle before he went back to Imam Hussein. His wife, Zuhair's wife, said to Zuhair, Ya Zuhair, this is the messenger of the man who his name, his grandfather's name is mentioned every day in your adhan. This is the messenger of the man who his grandfather is the essence of your adhan. You just did adhan, you just prayed. This is the messenger of that man's grandfather. How can you refuse him? How can you say no to him? So he was moved, he was inspired. And I tell you, this lady needs to be the inspiration of the woman in the world today. And especially those who attribute themselves to the school of Ahl al-Bayt. And those who attribute themselves to the camp of Zainab and Hussein. Why? Because today as a wife, the most important thing for me should not be if my husband's company grows, if his bank account becomes larger by the day, if our house becomes bigger, 
If our cars are more lavish and more comfortable and our vacations are instead of twice a year, four times a year, no. What I should care of is my husband's faith, my husband's iman, my husband's persistence on the side of haq and justice and his defense of the position of Ahl al-Bayt. This lady inspired her husband. She said to him, go and see what Hussein wants, him, wants from you. So this man, Uthmani al-Hawa, he goes into the tent of Imam Hussein and he speaks to Imam Hussein for several moments only. Only. And he comes back to his wife and he tells his wife, listen, for me it's a done deal. I would like to divorce you and I would like to give you all my wealth. Everything that I own, I will write it under your name. You're free to go. She said, why? He said, because I from now on will be joining the camp of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. And the camp of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, there is an inescapable death. Yazid has surrounded Hussein and he has ordered for Hussein to be finished. And I have decided to be on the side of Haq. I have decided to be on the side of justice. I have decided to serve the grandson of Hussein. You're free to go. She said to him, Zuhair, you think it's that easy? You will go on the side of the man and I will become a servant of the woman of Al Muhammad. We will go together. This is when Rasulullah meant in al Hussein misbah al huda. Hussein illuminates lives. Hussein changes lives. And then Rasulullah says, Wa safinatul najat. And he is that ship of salvation. He is that escape boat, that rescue boat. What do I, we hear this hadith so often. What does it mean? You see, back in the time of Rasulullah, people sometimes go on ships and the ship breaks and it sinks and they all die. There is one tiny bit of hope left in those who their boat breaks. What is it? The rescue boat. If a rescue boat happens to be nearby, then they can get rescued. And their lives will be saved. Rasulullah says, Hussein is that rescue boat. For those who are sinful, for those who have been separated from Allah, for those who have created long gaps between them and their Lord, hop on the rescue boat of Hussein. And Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq says, Nahnu kullu nasufun al najat. We are all the ships of salvation, we are all the rescue boats. However, in safina tajaddi al Hussein akbar wa awsa. But the rescue boat of my grandfather Hussein is much larger and it's much faster. Allahu Akbar Ya Aba Abdullah. And Imam Hussein cures the, Ill, the physical illnesses and the metaphysical illnesses. Not too long ago, I was in Karbala and a man came to my grandfather and he said to him, I would like to tell you why is it that I am in Karbala today. He said, I had heard that Imam Hussein, the majlis of Imam Hussein cures the ill. I've always heard that the ill people, they go to the majlis of Imam Hussein and they receive cure. So I was, I had cancer. And I tried everything. This man lives in Kuwait. He said, I went to the United States. I went to the UK. I tried every doctor. Nothing would help me. So he said, I had a Shia neighbor, a neighbor of the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. He said to me, listen, I have a majlis in my house tonight. Come to this majlis, maybe Allah will cure you in the majlis. So he said, this was my last hope. He said, I went to the majlis and in the majlis there was the remembrance of Imam Hussein. He said, I couldn't cry, but the person sitting next to me was crying. He said, I put my hands on his tears and I put them on my tongue. He said, then five days later, I went to the doctor, I went to the physician, I did my exams again, I re-examed myself. And the doctor said to me, this, the report from a month ago, two weeks ago, is incompatible with the reports today. There is nothing wrong with you. 
You may think you have had cancer, but you don't have anything right now. You're free to go. And that is, that is what motivated me to come to the shrine of Imam Hussein, to thank Imam Hussein. So Imam Hussein, no doubt, no doubt, he is the cure for the physical illnesses, and you all know this. We have no doubt. But Imam Hussein is also the cure to the metaphysical illnesses, to the spiritual illnesses, to the illnesses of the mind, to the illnesses of the soul. Hurr ibn Yazid al-Riyahi On the eve of Muharram, on the eve of Ashura He came He was the general He had 10,000 people under him He came to Umar ibn Sa'ad He said, what is that strategy tomorrow? What are we going to do? He said, the strategy is we will kill Hussein We will behead him and take his head to Ibn Ziyad He said to him, are you serious? He said, yes he got out of the tent, he, he was looking, drinking, alcohol, partying. The theft of religion, hijacking of the religion. He sat on the back of his horse, he went to the tents of Imam Hussein. He says, فَرَأَيْتُهُمْ بَيْنَ رَاكِعًا وَسَاجِدٍ وَتَالِيًا للقرآن. He saw some of them in ruku', some of them in sujood, some of them reciting the Qur'an. He stood right in the middle and he said, أُخَيِّرُ نَفْسِي بَيْنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَالنَّارِ It's a simple question. I see myself on one side the hellfire and on one side paradise. وَلَا أَخْتَارُ وَاللَّهِ فَوْقَ الْجَنَّةِ شَيْئًا And I will never choose anything above paradise. I came to Imam Hussein. On the t- several hours before the battle, he came to him. Imam Hussein, Imam Hussein said to him, Man ant, who are you? He said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, ana alladhi ja'ja'a bikum al-tariq. I am the cause of all this misery. Halli min tawbah? Imam Hussein says, Tubta ballahu alayk. Ask for forgiveness, Allah will forgive you. Therefore, those who tonight and the next upcoming nights and the previous nights find themselves stuck in a misery. On one side, the camp of Yazid, the lifestyle of Yazid, and let us be frank. And on one side, Imam Hussein and the camp of Hussein, the camp of Ali al Akbar. It's a simple question. Ask yourself. nafsi al Don't say, I have time. I have many years ahead of me. There is no such thing. Azrael will come knocking suddenly. Go. And when we want to examine this topic, one of the most beautiful, one of the most mesmerizing verses in the Holy Quran is of Surah Al Hadid. What does the verse say? The verse states, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Alam ya'ni lil ladina amanu an takhsha'a qulubuhum li dhikrillah. Isn't it time for the believers to feel the humility within their hearts for the remembrance of Allah? Number one, why was this verse sent down? Number two, which name is constantly associated with the tafsir of this verse? Number three, why is it that Allah asks in this verse, hasn't it been time for the believers to change and their hearts to become humble after the remembrance of Allah? Why is it that Allah asks us this question? And number four, what is the state of the khushu' and takhsha' qulubuhum li dhikrillah? And last but not least, number five, what is dhikrullah, the remembrance of Allah? Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This verse was revealed one year after the migration of Rasulullah from Mecca to Medina. And reference to Salman al-Muhammadi. Salman, as you know, was a Megan. 
And after that he became a Jew. He was on the Jewish faith, of the Jewish faith. But what Jewish faith? The Jewish faith with the Abrahamic monotheistic ornament, meaning one God, the day of judgment, Usul al-Din that we have. And after he was a Jew, he became a Christian. And a long story, you have to examine the life of Salman, inshallah, we'll examine the life of Salman in another session. When he became a Christian, this Jewish rabbi and the Christian priest shared with him what they knew of the end of time and the prophet of the end of time and the characteristics and the qualities of the prophet of the end of time. So he became an expert on the Old Testament, on the Talmud, on the Jewish literature. And then on the New Testament, on the Christian literature. But this priest that he was staying with was a corrupt priest. He would sell paradise to people, you know. And he would gather the money in his house. So when the priest died, and they all came to his burial, Salman was there, and he told them, listen, I know you're all upset that this guy is dead, but you should be happy. They said to him, why? He said, because I'm about to show you something you won't believe. This man, he wasn't selling you property in paradise. He was accumulating the wealth for himself. And he opened the basement of this guy's house and he said, this is the gold and the silver and the money. Come and take it. This belongs to you. So of course they were very happy that they got their money back. And Salman continued his journey to the Arabian Peninsula. He became a Muslim. He migrated to Medina. And the Muslimin, the companion, sometimes would come and tell him, Salman, tell us of your experiences. What's in there in the Talmud? What's in there in the Bible? What's in there in the Old Testament, the New Testament? Tell us of your previous experiences. What did those guys teach you? And Salman sometimes would share this with them. So Allah sent down this ayah, أَلَمْ يَعْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ if you seek remedy for this heart, if you want this heart to become humble, then recite the dhikr of Allah, which is the Holy Qur'an. Now this is the reason why some scholars, of course, have stated this is the reason why this verse was sent down. Regardless, some of the ulama refute this notion. Whose name is associated with this verse? A man by the name of Fudayl ibn al-Ayyan. Go look up Fudayl ibn al-Ayyan. He was one of the most immaculate people that lived around the years 187 after the Hijrah. He was born in the year 87 after Hijrah and died in the year 178 of the Hijrah. What is the story of this man? The story of this, the man is that he would intercept caravans. This was his job. He would intercept caravans. He would steal whatever they had. He would take their wealth. And sometimes he would take advantage of them as well. One day he intercepted a caravan that came from Khurasan. He took everything they had. He stripped them off everything they had. And he saw this beautiful Persian woman also there. So he told one of his guys, he said, I want you to follow those guys, see where they're going, where they're going to reside. I want to pay them a visit tonight. And one of his guys, one of his men took them, he saw where they resided, he came, he, he told Fudayl ibn al-Ayyan, this is the house. So Fudayl was done robbing everyone and finished everything. He's going to this person's residence. Without any hesitation, he's climbing the wall of the house to break into the house. Who can speak to Fudayl? He was a gangster. He has a huge gang. So he was climbing the wall. And as he was climbing the wall, he looked into the house of the neighbor. He saw a man with his sajada, with his prayer mat, under the sky. And the man was reciting the following verse, أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Hasn't it been time for the believers to feel humility in their hearts? 
Has it been time for the believers to feel that wake up call? Alam yani lilladina amanu an takhsha qulubuhum lidhikrillah. He froze. He froze. In the middle of the night, seeing a man speaking to Allah, reciting this verse, he froze. He couldn't move. He asked himself, has it been time? Is it enough for me? And immediately he shouted out, speaking to the man who was asking the question in the verse, Bal ata? Yes, the time has arrived. He got down from the wall, he sat on the horse. He doesn't want to go back to his old life. He's beginning a new life. He went somewhere and he saw a group of people asking, what should we do? Should we move now? Should we move in the morning? Are we okay? Are we going to be safe? What if Fudayl ibn al-Ayyan intercepts our caravan? He went to them. He said, don't worry about Fudayl. Fudayl is gone. Fudayl is history. They said, seriously? You know Fudayl? He's dead? He said, Fudayl is gone. He's dead. You can move the way you like. Fudayl will no longer harass you. They said, how do you know? He said, because I am Fudayl. I am Fudayl. For me, it's over. And Fudayl ibn al-Ayyan went and he became one of the students of Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al sadiq Today, the hadiths of Imam Ja'far are narrated to us through him. Some of the hadiths. Some of the mystic Orders of Imam al-Sadiq are given to us by Fudayl ibn al-Ayyan, this man. Then Allah asks the question, when we examine the verse, Allah says, Alam ya'ni, isn't it time for the believers? Why does Allah say, why does Allah ask us? Why doesn't Allah say, it's enough, O oh believers, it's enough for you, and you should take the words of God and become humble. No, Allah asks us, so we ask ourselves, I ask myself tonight, you ask yourself tonight, Alam Ya'ni, isn't it enough? I said several nights back to some of my friends, I said an average human being lives approximately 25,550 days. I want every one of you to go and calculate how many days you have over. How many days are gone? How many days you have left? That's it. That's if we reach the average. Sometimes Allah takes us way before the average. Ask yourself, isn't it enough? We sin and we sin and we need a life of a sinner. And we sometimes repent, yes. Sometimes we feel bad and that's why Allah gives us the time. Allah says as long as this person feels bad... There is no punishment for him. I'll give him time. Maybe he will repent. Maybe he will come back. And at times, no. We return to the sin. And we return to the sin until we, we become immune to the sin. Until the sin becomes part of our lifestyle. Until the sin takes, the sin takes over our life, our existence. Then, we cannot stop. Then that sin will... Stay with us for the rest of our life. Mastajiru billah. Allah asks, Alam ya'ni? Isn't it enough? Isn't it enough that this sin has become embedded in your life? Where are you headed? One day the Imam was walking in the streets of Medina. He saw a palace, a huge palace. And from the palace there was the sound of music. There was the sound of drinking. There was the sound of alcohol. There was the sound of partying. And he saw a lady taking out the garbage. So the imam was walking. He said to her, Oh lady, who does this house belong to? She said, This house belongs to a man by the name of Bishr. He said to her, Ya Amatallah, A Bishr hadha hurrun am abd. This Bishr, is he a free man or a slave? So she said to him, Ya Abdullah, how could he be a slave? Look at his house. Look at his mansion. Look at all the women in there. Look at the party. 
He said to her, that's what I thought. She said to him, what do you mean? How could he be a servant? He said, I thought he would be the abd of Allah. That's it. He walked away. When she went inside the house, Bish told her, where were you? She said, I don't know, this man was walking in the street. He said to me, who does this house belong to? I said, Bishr. He said to me, Abishrun hadha harrun am abd. I said, no, he is a free man. He said, that's what I thought. He said, then what did he say? He said, if he were to be a slave of Allah, a true abd, he would be ashamed of what he's doing. Bishr, without wearing his shoes, without wearing his sandals, without wearing his clothes, ran out of the house. He went to the imam and he said to him, I have changed. For me, it's over. Alam ya'ni? That question was asked of him and indeed he passed. And he was known from then on as Bishr al-Hafi. Bishr the barefoot. He never wore shoes for the rest of his life. And today, if you want to learn mysticism, if you want to learn the closeness to Allah, if you want to learn how a abid truly lives, go to Bishr al-Hafi. Those personalities, really, we need a whole sermon, we need a whole speech to talk about those personalities. Fudayl ibn al-Ayyan, Bishr al-Hafi. So Allah asks, and similarly we have to ask ourselves, is it enough for me? Then Allah says that we need to feel the humility in our hearts, the khushu'. What is khushu'? What is khushu'? You see, when we sin, each sin creates a black spot on our heart. We either get to erase it, or the black spot becomes bigger, and bigger and bigger until it takes over the whole heart. When it takes over the whole heart, the soul dies. And when the soul dies, it could never be resurrected. When the soul dies, that's it. It can never be resurrected. It could... Shim's soul was dead. Omar ibn Sa'ad's soul was dead. Imam Hussein on the Day of Judgment said, there's one thing wrong with those guys. Their hearts are dead. And of course, this heart needs to be pure. To feel the state of khushu' Allah says to Musa, He says, Musa, لا تسعني أرضي ولا سمائي The heavens, the skies, the universe, the galaxies, they can never occupy me, never. However, ولكن يسعني قلب عبدي المؤمن The heart of a believer can occupy me, a small heart. Allah is happy with the small space, believe me. Allah is happy to reside in that small space because it's a genuine space. Because it's a genuine heart. It's a pure heart. Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi states Inna haram Allah, inna qalb al-mu'min haram Allah. The heart of the mu'min is the sanctuary of Allah, is the house of Allah, is the residence of Allah. فَلَا تَسْكُنْ قَلْبَكَ غَيْرَ اللَّهِ Don't allow anything else to reside in this heart. Why? Brothers, we have seen many people <coughs> involved in the worldly desires, the worldly love. And Allah says this in the Holy Quran, وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّا You love wealth, you love the dunya. الْمَالُ وَالْبَنُونَ زِينَةُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا People that are eager for position, for example. After 40 years remaining in position, the guy still wants to stay in position. After 30 years, he's still fighting for the chair. After 28 years, he still wants to stay in power. They don't have enough. They never have enough because Rasulullah states, حُبُّ dunya Being infatuated with the dunya is like drinking salt water. You will never feel that your thirst has been quenched. You always want more and more and more. In fact, the more you drink, the more thirsty you become. Or one million dollars. Some people say, say it. I get the million and my life is going to change. Wallah, that's a lie. We should cry. Wallah, we should cry. We shouldn't laugh. 
The million has to become two, and the two has to become three, and the three has to become ten. And until the last moment, huh? Until the last moment, the guy Azrael, he sees Azrael, he's thinking of his business. We never have enough. The dunya will never give us enough. But there is one feeling that will allow this heart to be at ease. To be at ease. أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ الْقُلُوبِ the remembrance of Allah will put this heart at ease. Try it. It's a free trial. The remembrance of Allah will put this heart at ease. Allow Allah to occupy this heart, you will be at ease. This is the state of khushu of the heart. Then Allah says, Allah With the remembrance of Allah. The remembrance of Allah sometimes could be salah, sometimes could be reciting the Qur'an, and sometimes it's mere remembrance of Allah. And any remembrance I tell you of Allah is good. As long as you have Him in mind, that's it. When Musa was going to Mount Sinai to speak to Allah for 40 days, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا He was on his way, there was an old man, he said to him, Musa, come here. So Musa came, he said to him, what do you need? He said to him, where are you going, Musa? He said to him, I'm going to Mount Sinai. He said to him, what are you going to do in Mount Sinai? The mountain of Tur. He said to him, I have been invited to speak to my Lord, to Allah. He said to him, I have a message for your God, can you take it? He said, yes, why not? He said, tell him, I hate you. Tell him I'm fed up with you. Tell him I have nothing to do with you. Tell him I don't want your wealth, I don't want the money, I don't want the health, I don't even want anything. Take everything away from me, I don't want. Musa was very upset. He said to him, what do you mean? What, what language is this? He said, listen, this is a message. Just take the message. So Musa, he went the first day, he didn't tell Allah. The second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the tenth day, fiftieth day, nineteenth day, twentieth, thirtieth, thirty-ninth. Speaks to Musa. Allah speaks to Musa for forty days. The last day Allah said, Musa, is there nothing else that we should discuss? Musa said, no, ya Allah. There's nothing. He said, are you sure, Musa? He said, ya Allah, there is a message from this guy, crazy guy. But I'm ashamed to tell you. He said, tell me, Musa. The message, is it for me or for you? He said, no, Ya Allah. He said, it's for you. He said, so tell me the message. So he said, this old man, he saw me and he said, he, he has nothing to do with you. He doesn't want your sustenance. He doesn't want your rizq. He doesn't want health. He doesn't want anything. And he hates you. Allah said, Musa, go to him. Go to him and tell him, I created you. And I will never cut my rizq from you. Even if you ask for Allah to cut your rizq, Allah will never cut your rizq. Imagine a mother, can she stop feeding her, ch- her son, her child? No. Allah says, tell him I will never cut my rizq. In the month of Rajab, what do we read? Ya man yu'ti man sa'alah. Ya man yu'ti man lam yas'al. Wa man lam ya'raf. Oh, the one that gives those who ask him and those who do not ask him and do not know him. This is Allah. And second, tell him, Ya Musa, that if he's cut his rope with me, I have my rope always there. He can always take the rope and come to me. I will never cut that rope. I will never destroy that bridge. He is always welcomed and I will always accept him. This is Allah. The remembrance of Allah leads us to such conclusions, brothers, to such ends. The remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gives us an instant purification. Don't say, but say it, you come for 10 nights, we become inspired, we may like to change, then you leave, and everything goes back to normal. Yes, 99. Point nine 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 percent of the time, it's this way, unfortunately. 
Unfortunately, this is the reality. But there is one person, two people, three people that know it will resonate. It will be their wake-up call. They will decide they will change. They were, they're going to be new individuals. From now on, I don't care about the wealth. I don't care about the popularity. I don't care about anything. The only thing I care about is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. Because if I have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have everything. And if I don't have Allah and I have everything else, I have nothing. Imam Hussein and Dua al Arafah. He says, Mada wajadaman faqadak. Mada wajadaman faqadak. Wa mada faqadaman wajadak. He asks Allah, he says, Oh Allah, what do they have, those who do not have you? What do they have? They have money, what? they have nothing. They have zero. And those who have you, what have they missed? They're not missing anything. Imam Zainul Abideen in Dua Abu Hamza Thamari, he states, Oh Allah, you never put a curtain and a hijab between you and your abd. وَلَكِنْ تَحْجُبُهُمُ الْأَعْمَالُ دُونَكِ Oh Allah, your door is always open. You're always there. You're very close. But our acts create a hijab between us and you, O oh Allah. وَلَكِنْ تَحْجُبُنَا الْأَعْمَالُ دُونَكِ and the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifies us, brothers and sisters. Sometimes we ask ourselves, why is it that we do dua? Why is it that we pray and the dua is not accepted? Why? It's simple. Sometimes you go and you apply for a job. They tell you, have you been arrested? Yes or no? If you say yes, you're less likely to get the job. Have you involved yourself in a felony? If you say yes, less likely to get the job. Have you been, for example, all the negative things? If you say yes, less likely. If you say no, more likely. If you go with a clean slate, they'll tell you this is the job. Welcome. If you have a clean slate, you go to Allah. Allah says this is your dua. Welcome. But if you say yes to everything, do you lie? Yeah. yeah. Commit crimes? Yes. Riba? Yes. Theft? Yes. Ghiba, yes. Namima, yes. Jealousy, yes. Hypocrisy, yes. What, how, how is this dua going to be accepted? When Musa took his qawm, Bani Israel, with this I conclude. When he took them to pray for the rain, they had a drought. Allah said, Oh Musa, there is a man. Jibra'il, go tell Musa, there is a man in this place. Community and the people, he's a sinner, he's a sinful guy. As long as he's there, the rain is not going to come, not even a single drop. So Musa, he stood up, he said, People, there is a sinful person amongst you. <coughs> we all know what we do. We all know. It's inescapable. He said, there is a sinful person amongst you. And he knows who he is. Allah says, as long as he is here, the rahmah of Allah will not be sent. So please try to leave the community. Try to leave the gathering. This person was not leaving. He was stuck. Musa says, Jibra'il, go and ask Allah who this person is. Give me his name, I'll take him out myself. Jibra'il went and he came back and he said, Musa, Musa, wake up. Allah dislikes this man because he exposes the sins of others. Allah has stopped his reign because this man is a man that his job 24-7 exposing other people. You want Allah to do the same? Thank Allah if you know of a sinner that you have covered up for. Thank Allah. 
but then be afraid if you expose him. <coughs> this is Allah's formula. Or her, doesn't matter. At that time, the man standing there said, Oh Allah, he went to the closest person to him. Nobody at that time can help him, except the one, أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ Closer to him than his jugular vein. He finally woke up. He said, Oh Allah, save me. Save me. Save my dignity. Save my honor. I truly have repented. I will truly not go back to the sin. Suddenly the clouds gathered and the rain began to pour. So Musa said, Jibra'il, tell Allah, has he changed his mind? Jibra'il went and he came back and he said, No, Musa, the man changed his mind. The man decided that he was going to open that beautiful chapter, that clean slate for himself. Thank Allah for being here tonight. And Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq says that ship is much bigger and faster. And we all need to hop on that ship tonight. Why? When we examine the personalities of Ashura, and tonight we come across a young man by the name of Qasim ibn al-Hasan. To him, he could have lived the best life. He could have had the best life. He could have become whoever he wishes to be. But yet he only saw Allah. In his eyes, to him, happiness, to him, the wealth of the world, to him, the happiness of the world was to stand next to his uncle in the day of Ashura. Imam Imam Hussein says to him, Bunayya Hassan, Kayfa tara al mawtu dunak? How do you find this death that you're about to approach to? The death that you're walking towards, how do you find this death? He said, Fi nusratika ya am ahla min al asal. In order to protect you, in order to protect your cause, in order to stand next to you, it is sweeter than honey, Ya Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And the nights are passing us very quickly, very quickly. We say to him, Sayyid Ya Aba Abdullah, if until today you have not written our name of those of your khuddam, of those of your servants, of those who you glance at just like the glance that you gave to Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. You looked at Zuhair ibn al-Qayn and momentarily you changed his whole life. We are here for that glance only. We want that same glance that you gave to Harr ibn Yazid al-Riyah and we are here only for that glance, Ya Aba Abdullah. We are only here for no other reason but to see your beautiful face in the first night of our graves. To receive your shafa. We are here to put you in front of us and go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Aba Abdullah. And we are here to seek your help to become new individuals, better individuals. يا سيدنا ومولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند الله يا وجيها عند الله يا وجيها عند الله (تصفيق) 
He came to his uncle. His uncle looked at him. He said to him, Oh, Qasim. O oh, Qasim, come close to me. Imam Hussein hugged him. And he cried and he cried. Qasim said to him, Ya Ammah, Ya Aba Abdullah, what is it that makes you cry? He said, those tears remind me of, your, of my brother Hassan. You are the only man who reminds us of my brother Hassan. I would hate to give you this permission. Then he insisted, he kissed the, his, his uncle's hands, he begged him. But Imam Hussein sent him back to his mother. When he sent him back to his mother, his mother said to him, take this. She gave him an amana and give it to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. He took the amana. There was a amana of Imam Hassan. There was a sword of Imam Hassan. There was a dress for Qasim from Imam Hassan and there was a letter. Written by his brother Imam Hassan saying to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, there will be a day on the 10th of Muharram that there will be no one next to you. You will have no Ansar, you will have no companions, and I have kept this son to protect you on the 10th of Muharram. So Imam Hussain cried, cried and he put that Amama of Imam Hassan on top of his son's head. He gave him the dress, he gave him his father's sword, and he told him, Bunay barakallahu feek. I ask Allah to give victory to you. He sat on the back of the horse, a young man, his face full of light, the light of Al Muhammad. He went and he looked at the ocean of enemies, and he said, he says, if you do not know me, I am Qasim, the son of Hassan. I shall protect the grandson of the Prophet because you have turned him into a prisoner in this desert. He began to fight and he fought as a brave man. At that young age, historians say he was able to defend Imam Hussein with 120 men. And as Imam Hussein would watch him, suddenly there was a man, a vicious man, who had waited for Qasim to pass next to him. He was saying, wait until Qasim, wait until Ibn al-Hassan comes next to me. Wallah, la'athkalanna bihi ammuh. I'll make his uncle cry for him. His companion was telling him, isn't it enough? There are many people surrounding him. He said, Wallahi la'af'al. Wallah, I will make Hussein cry for Qasim. He went from the back of his horse and he struck the young man with his sword. He fell from the horse saying, Ya Ammah, alayka minni salam. Oh, I'm trying to come to my rescue. They say Imam Hussein went to him very fast. He sat next to his body. He held him. He said to him, Ya Qasim, Ya Am, Azza ala ammuka, an yujibuka, wa la yanfa'uk. Yawma qalla nasuruhu wa mu'inuhu. He says, Qasim, I've come to your rescue, but I've come too late. Oh, Qasim, I've come to your rescue on a day where your uncle has no nasir. Your uncle has no mu'in. He hugged him and he went back to the tents. He put him in the tents of Bani Hashim. The women gathered. The children gathered next to the body of Qasim. Crying for Qasim, weeping for Qasim, Allahu Akbar. Then his mother came, Ramla. <laughs> 
looking at the body of her son. She said to him, son, if they killed you, why did they chop you into pieces? <laughs> But I tell you, ya sahab al-zaman, moments later, your grandfather, Abba Abdullah, didn't have anyone to carry his body into the tent. Moments later, the body of your grandfather was laid on the sands of Karbala. Not only that, then the call came. I want to hear the cries of the brothers and the sisters. Wallah. The call came from Umar ibn Sa'd, looking at the body of Hussein under the son of Karbala. <laughs> ya khayl Allah <laughs> All the horsemen ride your horses. Wa sadr al Hussein dizi. And tremble the body of Hussein. As Sayyid Zainab says, I can hear the bones of Hussein. <laughs> All the way in the tents, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and Al-Mu'azza Sayyidi. Ya Fatima al-Zahra, Ya Fatima al-Zahra, we want you to glance at this majlis tonight. The majlis of your son, the majlis of your grandson, Qasim ibn al-Hassan. Two lines in Arabic for Fatima al-Zahra, and I ask you for your dua. أفاطم لا أخلت الحسين مجدلا Oh Fatima, you should have been there. أفاطم لا أخلت الحسين مجدلا وقد ما تعطشانا بشط فراتي died thirsty next to the Euphrates of Fatima. Then la la tam til khad Fatima عنده وأسكنت إذا لا لا طمت الخد فاطم عنده Kasi me nao shad